Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, small children, and gifted woodland animals, welcome once again to Plot Points. Uh, it is I, Ben Reeves, coming to you live as the internet can be. And with me on the line from exotic Seattle, I have Monty Cook. Monty, how are you? I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, th- thanks for having me on. It's, it's my pleasure to have you here. I think you are now tying Jim Ward and Jim uh, Louder as the people I've interviewed the most in my gaming geek career so that's good should... company to be in <laughs> it certainly is um so uh we're having you on today because you are kickstarting a product called Taulus. um and again we have a lot of people that are very new to dungeons and dragons on this podcast uh could you tell again a seventh grader who doesn't know what Taulus is uh what it is and let me know if i'm pronouncing it wrong uh sure so uh, i can do better than that Ooh. I can show you. Wow. This is Talus. This massive, massive tome right here is Talus. Um, and uh, this was a, a book that uh, I published through Malhavik Press uh, in 2006. And it was basically the campaign setting that I ran when I was working on 3rd edition D&D. And so uh, I ran this for a lot of years. And uh, I I sort of made it kind of like the house setting for for all the D&D games that I ran. Um, And, you know, playtested a ton of Melhavik Press products using this. And anyway, so it was all published through the D20 system, so it was all compatible with 3rd edition back then. And now Monty Cook Games uh, uh, got the rights to do this, which I know is, is weird because I was Melhavik Press and now I'm Monty Cook Games, but, you know, it's all weird legal stuff. But anyway, um, uh, we are going to publish this. We're going to publish two different versions of it. Uh, one is going to be compatible with 5e, and one is going to be Cypher System. So uh, we're very excited. We're going to um, take this big deluxe book and make it even better. <laughs> so uh, in, in researching for this interview, uh, I noticed that in the, the PDF of Taulis I have, you uh, mentioned that the campaign started in 1996 when you still would have been at TSR. Um, and of course, that is a era of Dungeons and Dragons history that I'm really interested in. Could could you tell me about the the deep origins of this campaign setting in 1996? Well, so uh, you're right in, uh, but but only sort of in a very technical sense. So I ran a game, a second edition D and D game, uh, set in a world called Primal, which is actually the world that Talus the city is in. And uh, the idea was that Pramel was just a few decades after the gods created the world, right? And so, you know, what I wanted to do was I wanted to capture that idea that, you know, when you talked about those great his those you know great history and 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 those heroes from you know the days when the gods walked the earth and everything, I wanted to actually have a campaign that was playing that rather than referring back to it. And then what I did uh, when we started working on third edition was I advanced that campaign a couple thousand years <laughs> and uh, and set uh, Talus in in that same world, playing off of things that had happened, you know, in the prehistory of the world that we had just played through in the previous campaign. Who who were your original players in 1996? Um, if, if you can recall. Uh, that would be Michelle Carter, um, John Ratliff, Bruce Cordell, um, possibly Keith Strom, if I'm remembering. Oh, and Sean Reynolds, of course. Okay, that's oh, that's quite the uh, quite the collection. Um, yeah. And I, I would love having played with uh, John Ratliff. I would love to know what he's like in an extended campaign. I've only played one shots with him, and I, I should say, listeners, uh, he was uh, an old hand at TSR. Uh, he almost acquired the rights for TSR to make a uh, Middle Earth role playing game uh, at one point. But again, he's an absolutely fascinating guy. He's written Le- the definitive. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, a legit Tolkien scholar. Like, not just a big fan, but 
but an actual scholar. Yeah, he, he has written the definitive work on the different versions of The Hobbit written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, so I would have just... It, I, I wish I could somehow go back in time and see that happen. But anyway, um, <laughs> so was there a hiatus as you transitioned to Seattle after TSR was purchased by Wizards of the Coast? Because I, I don't know if all those people made that transition with you. They did. Um, and I don't remember. I imagine there was okay. uh, the whole process. I seem to remember the whole process kind of happening over the summer. Like I want to say that Wizards brought us out in maybe like July or so of that, of, of 97, right, I think. And we probably didn't start actually working full time until after Gen Con, so that would have been like in September. Okay. Um, so you also mentioned in the, the prior version of Tallis that, uh, quote, all aspects inherit to D20 system fantasy games, uh, you're trying to bring them to life in a single city. Uh, could, could you give any examples of how you were trying to bring the system to life in Talos? Yeah. yeah, so what I was fascinated with was the idea of not a dungeon, but the dungeon, right? That there's sort of this huge mammoth, you know, we might use the word mega dungeon or something like that, but this huge underground area that we would think of um, like almost like a subterranean wilderness, right? Like I'm going out into the wilds while I'm going down into the dungeon. And, uh, I, 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 you know, because, because dungeons, like if you remember when third edition came back, one of the, or when third edition was published, one of the, uh, sort of core tenets was we were bringing back the dungeon and, and the experience of exploring a dungeon and everything. So I wanted to embrace that fully but I wanted to do something that I've been thinking about a long time, which was sort of the dungeon as the gold rush, right? And so uh, I modeled uh, at least parts of Tolis on, on like a gold rush kind of community where there's people going into this dangerous place, some of them bringing back inordinate amount of wealth, right? And some of them not coming back and, and, and flooding the market with, with, you know, crazy, weird, ancient treasures and whatnot, and having an undue need for things like, you know, 10-foot poles and 50 <laughs> feet of rope and uh, things like that. <clears throat> and and so, you know, an economy kind of grows up around uh, the needs of, of uh, what the setting calls Delvers and, uh, and play off of that. And the other thing that I really wanted to embrace with Tolis is... Um, is the idea, uh, again, in third edition, what we really wanted to do is we really wanted to make the game playable from level one to level 20. And so to represent that in both metaphorically and literally, um, Tolis is the city and there is this sort of unnaturally tall and sharp spire. I mean, it's called Tolis, the city by the spire. And at the top of this spire, there is this foreboding evil fortress. Um, that is just sort of rumored to be the worst place in the world, the most dangerous, <laughs> terrible place. And so, like I said, it, metaphorically, but also literally, at any point, even first level characters can just look up and they can see what they're going to be doing at 20th level. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and another thing I, I couldn't help but notice in your introduction to the uh, prior version of Tolis, which I assume will, I should ask this question. Will the introduction to the Tolis that currently exists be in the next edition, or are you going to revise the introduction? Um, well, do you mean the player's guide? No, I mean, like, uh, when I flipped open the PDF of the current oh, third oh, edition version the literal of Tolis. introduction. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's going to need a brand new introduction. Okay. Uh, because... What it what the original Tolis introduction talks about is how everything is geared specifically for third edition, and so obviously now we are changing those gears um, and making them work for for five e and cipher. Well, that that was going to be actually my next question was to what degree are you revamping the setting? Since I, I can't think of another setting 
that is so explicitly uh, an extension of the rules. Like, I feel like a lot of designers would be like, well, I'm going to make my setting. Now I'll make a rule system to support that setting. I can't think of another setting off the top of my head where the reverse is true and you took a rule set and, and gave it life in, uh, in setting form. So my question would be, to what degree are you revising the setting since the rules have changed? Well, so as far as 5e goes, we have the advantage that... Um, that 5e and 3e share a lot of sensibilities, um, if not mechanically, certainly uh, in flavor and tone, right? The, the classes are kind of all the same and, you know, what the roles that the various classes play, you know, there's there's warlocks now in 5e and so there will be warlocks in 5e Tolis, um, but uh, uh, it, it won't be too hard. And with Cypher, it would be a completely different story, but the nice thing there is that Cypher is uh, straightforward enough and customizable enough that we'll just put, the, put enough uh, material into this book to make it so that you can basically play this kind of Dungeons & Dragons in using the Cypher system, right? Awesome. Very cool. Um can you think of any any changes that you did have to make to the actual setting for either five year cipher system? Anything specific that come to mind or well the warlock example is Oh the warlock that yeah, you're right. You're right. That's um and uh not a lot. Um the the kind of changes that we'll have to make that are flavorful and not mechanical be pretty small okay. um you know maybe like some of the uh availability or not availability of certain items the that we might have to change some of the creatures because the um the the ip that that wizards claims is slightly different in third and fifth so there might be a couple of monsters we can't use anymore we'll have to replace with something else but they will be very minor. Okay. Like that. Fans of the original will not probably even notice. <laughs> now, uh, a, f a kind of follow-up question to that. When you were designing New Minera and Invisible Sun, did you go system first, then setting, or setting first, then system for those two games? For New Minera, it's a little odd because I... I had an idea for this game system and I had an idea for this setting and it took me absurdly long to realize that I should put them together. <laughs> um, and uh, because, you know, I, I had developed them at completely different times in my career, you know, many, many, many years ago, both in both cases. And uh, so that was just sort of, I, I think I was pursuing the setting and then I realized and then I wanted to build a system around it and then realized, oh, you know, I have this idea for this uh, system with, you know, stat pools and everything. Um, I'm going to pull that forward. And then uh, it did get it did the, the system. I would say the, the system got massaged to fit the setting and not the reverse. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. Invisible Sun is different because Invisible Sun actually started out with the idea that it was going to be a cipher system game. And as that setting developed, I realized that it really needed its own, uh, its, its own unique system. Um, but that's why you will notice that there are some similarities, uh, particularly sort of in sensibilities of the way character or way players interact with their own character and stuff um huh. you know a little bit of resource management and that kind of thing do you have, do you have any preference between setting or system is there one you prefer designing over the other um boy it really kind of depends on the day you ask me the question <laughs> uh, fair, you know, fair enough <laughs> i'm tempted to say setting right now but tomorrow i might say system <laughs> um what motivated you to uh revise re-release and kickstart Taulus? honestly it was because so many people asked for it and it 
I wasn't actually even aware. Uh, I had been aware of it um, years ago, but then when when um, MCG started up and and we you know got people. Uh, who do a fantastic job working on uh, our customer service and managing our social media and everything. A lot of that, like I was distanced from a lot of that. And um, I think it was Charles Ryan, our, our COO, had mentioned, you know, well, what if MCG, you know, Birch's threats to Tullus? And, and I was like, I don't know, is anybody going to really want that? And, and you know, all the customer service and 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 social media people, and it was like, oh, yes, people really, people have been asking for that. We get that question like once a week, when are you going to update this for 5e and, and Cypher? So it, it was a no-brainer um, once I became really aware of that. And, uh, you know, the Kickstarter is doing pretty well. So uh, uh, they, they must have been at? right. Yeah, can I ask what it's at right now? I didn't look today. Um, I would have that's to. Fine too. That's fine. I would have to go look. Um, I'll put it in the show notes. I'll okay, it's <laughs> fine. Um, let's see, I asked that. Uh, oh, so in Taulis, uh, you said that this was the longest game book ever produced by a single author. I think that's still true. To your knowledge, is that still true? I'm gonna guess yes. Because I. I, I I feel like I get a lot of gaming stuff and I can't think of anything longer than that done by a single person. Right. I think there are now probably one or two things that are, are actually larger books, but I like the one that I'm thinking of, I think is like the new Grim Tooth Trap collection. It's not that new, but yeah. they collected all the Grim Tooth Trap books and that's a, this and I have it. It's really cool. Um, <laughs> it's a huge mammoth book, but that of course is lots of different authors. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, another interesting thing, like, even if you get rid of this introduction from the original version, I have to tell you, it's, it's very well written and really Thanks. gave a great uh, uh, window into your process on creating Taulis. So uh, whatever you put there instead, if you could somehow keep that, it would be wonderful. Because one of the things that, again, you mentioned in the introduction was that you use travel guides to inform oh, your absolutely. creation of the book. Please tell me about that. Um, so, uh, so way in the olden days before the internet kids, um, <laughs> you know, uh, my, uh, former wife and I, we traveled a lot, but we would always get these really cool books. They were done by DK publishing. Um, and you know, so you'd have a travel guide to London or whatever. And, um, well, I can just show you here if I can hold this giant book up in front of the camera. <laughs> But um, what it would have, these books, would be um, like this uh, a side section that would have references to where you could find out more information about something, you know, like if it happened to mention, like if you were in London and it was like talking about the Tower of London and how you could see Buckingham Palace from there, it would tell you, oh, more on Buckingham Palace on page 57 or whatever. So we adapted that. Um, and we adopted uh, this from, which is really useful, which is, so the stuff that is being discussed on this, it tells you right where you can find the map. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, both, both uh, uh, more information in this call-out column as well as uh, pictures, because pictures are, are kind of a mnemonic device. So like every time, um, think like every time like chaos cults come up that we show that guy right or, or whatever <laughs> and uh and so that kind of really user-friendly kind of approach uh is what i wanted because i knew i mean i have i have run a lot of games and um <laughs> you know i know i know you know the challenges that are in front of of a gm or a dm and um you know, there was just no way that I was going to put together a book like this and just make it a regular book and say, OK, well, good luck. Um, you know, I, I knew that it had to be really user friendly, hyper referenced. I mean, this book has mul doesn't just have a good index. It has multiple indices, right? It has <laughs> you know, a people index, a places index, uh, you know, an, an everything index. Um, and, uh, you know, you. you my goal really was to make it so that there weren't wasn't a lot of book referencing, wasn't a lot of flipping. 
um, that you just kind of always knew what you needed to know and and had at your fingertips what you needed to have. And, you know, to that end, like, you know, like we've all had the experience, you know, you're running a game and a player says, OK, well, uh, I, I stop someone on the street and I ask them, you know, what's going on? Why is this building burned down or whatever? Right. Uh, so every st single district in the city, one of the things in the start in the beginning section is people on the street, right? So that the GM can just look at that and it gives you three different people who would be walking around <laughs> in that district just for that reason, right? And the cool thing about that is, is that it, you know, I mean, cause a GM can just come up with just some person, but these people all have, you know, personality and maybe a, a plot hook, you know, and um, so uh, it, it just, I, I hope anyway, that this is a setting that really comes alive when it comes to your table. and. I'm lucky enough that, you know, I've heard, you know, from all the people who had the original that, you know, they had great campaigns and it, it's been really fun over the years hearing about um, people uh, and their, the games that they've run and the things that they did and how they made it up to the top of that tower. And... <laughs> That's very cool. So uh, if you were going to sit down at a table with uh, a group of D&D &D players that hadn't played Taoist before, uh, what NPC or threat or adventure would you deploy at that table to, to hook them on Taoist? Um, well, uh, so I would probably default to the answer that I had back in 2006 when I ran some games at Gen Con. Um, there's... Uh, there's a, a a cult, an evil cult in in uh, Tullus called the Cult of the Ebon Hand. Um, they're kidnapping people. People are disappearing off the street. What's going on, right? And that's sort of the setup. It's really simple and straightforward. It's city based, but it's it's an adventure that then draws you down into the dungeon because they're being taken down there, and you know horrible experiments and are are being done in them. Nice. And, and got to save people, and and so it. Uh, the reason that I choose that is because it is that it, it involves the city because the city is as important to the adventures as as the dungeon, but it also involves the dungeon. Um, and and the city, you know, isn't just the place you go to buy rope and more rations, right? It's uh, there. There's lots of stuff going on in the city too. Um, so I, I wanted to have something that that did both. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I've I've had a PDF of uh, the original Taoist for a number of years now, and it you know obviously it's very long, and I just hadn't had a chance to <laughs> I hadn't had a chance to crack it open until uh, this interview was scheduled. But again, it, it seems delightful, and uh, I'm looking forward to to backing uh, the the current version. Well, uh, thank you. Well, and I just started a fifth edition game like a week ago, nice. so it's it's very convenient. You know, I can <laughs> work them up a few levels, send them to Taoist. It'll be fun. Um, yeah. But uh, the uh, now yesterday I was talking to uh, Michael Parker, who works for ACD Distribution, and listeners, you you might not know, but ACD Distribution uh, is a company that distributes role playing games and other tabletop products. And I asked him, so you know, what's a game that you think might not have gotten enough love that you'd want to tell people about? And without hesitation, uh, he said, "Invisible Sun." Oh, it was nice. The, the first thing out of his mouth. And he said it reminded him of uh, Mage the Ascension, and Mage the Ascension is one of my favorite games. <laughs> and I, I will confess, I have, uh, I've essentially avoided Invisible Sun because it was so intimidating. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, if if I'm going to talk about Invisible Sun, I'm going to have to read this whole thing. It's a large box. Uh, but hearing him say it's, it's like Mage the Ascension, and it's a game that hasn't gotten enough love. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm probably going to have to now go buy the box. Uh, but that said, since this happened yesterday and I happen to be talking to you today, I wanted to <laughs> ask you, so how would you explain uh, Invisible Sun to someone like me, who I know it's uh, a product by you, uh, and I know it's obviously about magic and wizards, but other than that, what can you tell me about the game? So uh, the premise of, of Invisible Sun 
is that uh, the rea- reality as we know it now, uh, that the, what we consider to be the real world, isn't the real world at all. Um, it is, in fact, a place that is referred to as shadow. And uh, at, um, this, <laughs> uh, I don't want to. I don't want to get off into diversion. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, as player characters, you have just discovered or recently discovered that you know you don't belong here you belong in the much larger world which we refer to as the actuality and you are actually wizards which are called bizlay in the setting and uh you have just returned to the city of satarine where you were originally from and uh you know, you ha- are, are a Vizlay and you belong to one of the orders of magic and you have a house because uh, Vizlay's house, er- everyone, uh, a Vizlay's house is, is sort of almost another part of them, right? And your house can change and grow, sometimes literally, um, you know, as you do and, you know, can gain weird new things just like you do as your, as your character advances. And so the, you know, the different orders of magic are like uh, the Goetics who summon spirits and demons and things. There's the Vancians who uh, uh, see magic as this very sort of regimented, um, uh, clearly understood thing. And they take spells and they put them in their head. Um, sort of like Sounds we're... familiar. <laughs> uh, there's um, makers that make uh, they, they, they manifest their magic through making things. Uh, there's weavers who weave magic. And so they kind of, it's a very, their magic is very open-ended. Um, and then there are apostates who say, screw all those orders. I don't care about any of that. I'm just going to do magic the way I want to do it. And um, the one of the things that makes uh, Invisible Sun really fun but a little intimidating until you realize that it's not as bad as you think is that the five different types of magic all have essentially a completely different magic system and so it the the cool thing about that is that if i'm playing a a weaver and you're playing a vance and uh uh, you start using your magic i'm going to look over across the table and i'm going to be like what are you doing? How how did you do that? Right? And and then later I'm going to do something. You're going to be like, magic doesn't work that way. How did you do that? Right? Um and the reason that it's it's not as bad as you think is is that because as a Vance, you only need to know how Vanzian magic works. You don't in, in in fact, it's more fun if you don't know how Weaver magic works because then you're just constantly going, "What are you doing?" Um which uh Ultimately, one of the goals of Invisible Sun is to make magic more magical, right? And 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 less, you know, regimented. And we all know how this works, and it's just like a science. And 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 make it once again very fluid and and mysterious. And uh, um, yeah. Well, he, uh, um, again, I, I've certainly been intimidated by the product, but one of the things that he kept returning to when he was discussing it was that it's very easy for the game master to run. So, and again, like ordinarily I would be kind of skeptical, but just, you know, having, being as familiar with your work as I am, I'm like, oh, well, I'm sure Michael Parker and uh, Monty Cook aren't leading me astray here. I I should probably (laughs) feel confident it is easy to run. Um, So, okay. If if you're wizards, can I ask what you're doing or is it going to be a spoiler if I ask what are these wizards doing in the game? Basically, um, you know, you're you're investigating and learning new magical secrets and secrets of the universe. Basically, um, it's a game that's very much about knowledge. Um, uh, someone once joked that uh, Invisible Sun does kind of the weird and amazing thing in that it makes studying interesting (laughs) Um, (laughs) because you know uh, ultimately you know all of these uh, are are scholarly right they're you know they're bookish and um basically making that into an interesting endeavor uh and then of course you know realizing that you have to go out and battle demons or solve a mystery or whatever right i mean it's not the game's literally not just sitting in the library but I won't say that there isn't 
some sitting in the library. Um, <laughs> hey, you, um, that was always one of the best parts of a Call of Cthulhu session was going to the library and getting the clues. I, I agree completely, and that is definitely an influence on nice. this. Right? Okay, physical copies of this still exist? Uh, they do, but they are running out. They are, they are low. Oh, okay. <laughs> <sighs> you know, you know, like you become you you become an, a gaming journalist, and people start giving you stuff for free, and it's great. But you still want to support companies, so you spend money, and you know, you interview creators, and you do media, and you end up just wanting everything and spending more money than you should. But at least it's tax deductible now. Um, so, okay, I guess I'm going to have to go sell some old books to, to support the money I'll be sending to MCG in the next few weeks. Um, <laughs> so, Thank you. I, <laughs> we'll keep up the good work. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I'm hoping that this is not a spoiler, but uh, Michael Parker also casually mentioned that there are physical secrets in the physical Invisible Sun cube that you purchase. Can oh, you yes. confirm? Okay. Oh yes. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, there are there are things hidden in the text. There are there is. Um, hang on, I'll I'll get another visual aid here. Um. So there's uh, there's its own mysterious script that we don't translate for you, but but you can figure it out. And, and if you can't, people online already have. Um, and you know, there may be like multiple books and, and if you take the picture in one book and you come put it up against another one, you might learn something new and Damn yeah. it, Monty. <laughs> <laughs> well it's a game I mean ultimately it's a game about secrets. And so the game itself needed to have secrets, right? They and so actually opening the black cube is an experience in Invisible Sun all its own. Wow. Um, what games are you running right now? Uh, so I have an ongoing um, uh, Invisible Sun game, and uh, I am kind of doing some... I'm calling it proof of concept because it's so early uh, testing on some new games uh, that I'm playing around with. Um, I am, you know, having done, you know... Giant Tolis and you know Numenera, which has you know got enough material for multiple campaigns and Invisible Sun, Giant Black Cube. I'm kind of turning my attention a little bit toward the idea of the one shot game and how to capture certain kinds of play experiences with the one shot game and making that a really satisfying way to play. Um, I know that my group, and, and I'm sure that this is true for a lot of people, right? You've got, you know, maybe you've got a, a long-term game going on. Maybe you're playing 5e or whatever. And every once in a while, you want to do something different. You don't want to quit your regular game, but, but let's do something different and let's make it feel really different. Let's, let's, let's do something kind of outside the box. Um, and so I'm playing around with a lot of concepts about that. I, I take it that you have read or played uh, Bluebeard's Bride. I have. Okay. Because um, uh, I've just been reflecting on that game a lot lately. It's very cool. Yeah. And the, the question I've been asking myself is, uh, does the structure of that game and the character generation process, do, do, that, do, those, do those sequence of things... Uh, almost guarantee an experience of catharsis in playing the game. And by catharsis, I mean, like, the Aristotle's original Greek, like, an experience of fear and loathing. Uh, when, you know, when you see the fate of the bride in that game, which is almost always death or something terrible happening to you as no one believes you, um, right. I, I, I led myself to ask that question. And again, I don't have an answer because I haven't played the game enough to know if it's true. But it did provoke the question in me to what degree can a rule selection process in a one-shot game produce a reliable experience in a player. Uh, so it's interesting to hear that you're thinking about one-shot games because it seems like an exciting field. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a, it's really funny that you say that. Actually, it makes me think of two different things. The first is, um, so uh, my partner in crime, uh, Shauna Germain, is working on a product right now called We Are All Mad Here, which is a, a cipher system source book that is based around fairy tales, you know, Alice in Wonderland, we are all mad here. 
but she's also kind of grasping on that sentence and and taking a look at like a serious hopefully sensitive realistic look at mental illness and how we portray that in fiction and you know uh how how that sort of interacts with the world and uh and by that i mean the game world and so uh this this sort of default setting that comes with that you know the people that kind of are taken from the real world and go into this fairy tale world you know have all in some way been touched by some kind of mental illness and that is manifest in the sort of the persona that they have in the fairy tale world um and uh, it, it's very interesting to take a look at that and 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 kind of see. I mean, nobody thinks that a role playing game run by you know your your pals in your kitchen table should you know be like a therapeutic thing. But it, it is an interesting outlet if you want to explore those kinds of things and 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 talk about them. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we've obviously consulted with a lot of professionals and whatnot on this, and, and I think it's going to be a really interesting book. The other thing I wanted to mention is the digression that I avoided before, uh, but since you just brought up Aristotle, I now <laughs> know that you will get this reference, um, is that the reason that our, our world in Invisible Sun uh, that isn't real, it's called Shadow, is actually because of uh, Plato and the cave and the, the shadows that are on the wall from the fire uh, and the representation that that's actually not real. They're just shadows. Nice. Um, that's anyway. very cool. <laughs> very cool. Um, well, it's it's also just exciting to hear that uh, you guys at uh, Monty Cook Games are, are stretching and reaching and, and, and trying to break new ground in gaming. Uh, I, typically, I'm of the opinion that if, if you're going to be remembered, you either have to be the first or, or to some degree, the best. And Dungeons and Dragons was definitely the first. Uh, and, and we're in a golden age of role playing, and we're seeing a lot of great games out there. And I, I think that something like the best co will come in attempting to get role playing to deal with more difficult topics. And again, like Bluebeard's Bride to me is a great example of that, yes. where. Uh, you know they're they're really trying to do something and and provoke an experience that's not just fun around the table, uh, a, a more refined artistic experience. Um, and uh, it's it's probably harder to do that with a role playing game than say with a, a poem or a novel because you're not in control of what actually is going to be happening. You know, uh, you can only set the rules and let the chips fall where they may. So I think it's a really interesting challenge and a difficult one. So it's good to hear you guys are attempting that and tackling it. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly interested and can't wait to hear about it. Uh, <laughs> so um, my understanding is you're into comics. Is that still true? Uh, yes, I have been a lifelong comics fan, um, and my tastes of late are much more sort of in the independent realm than in the big two, um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, huge comics fan. Nice. Uh, they're, they're my, comics are my tertiary nerddom, um, like, uh, it definitely comes after role-playing games and then genre literature. But I, I do really enjoy comics. So is there anything you would recommend? Um, I am uh, uh, reading right now Monstrous uh, by Marjorie Liu. Um, it's a really interesting fantasy uh, uh, world with uh, the main character has access to these powerful horrible evil things and and how is she going to wield that power kind of thing um let's see so uh i'm just finishing up a series by rick remainder called rick remainder called um uh black science which is um uh, you know, travel through the various dimensions of the multiverse, kind of crazy, wacko, gonzo kind of thing. Um, let's see, what else just recently have I been reading? Um, uh, you know, I will read almost anything by um, uh, Grant Morrison. I will read almost anything by... Uh, 
uh, sh- uh, his name is escaping me, but Saga and Why the Last Oh, yeah. Um, uh, um, Brian Vaughn? Yes, Brian Vaughn. Okay. Thank you. Um, pretty much anything. Yeah, I read. Just He just finished up a series called Paper Girls that, uh, that I loved. Um, and, of course, he's got Saga still going on. Um, so, yeah, lots of comics. Nice. I'll, I'll, I'll check those out because... Uh, I, I really enjoy comics, but I'm, I'm definitely um, finicky might be the right word. You know, like it, it certainly surprises me how many not great comics get made. <laughs> so I, I feel like the curation of someone who knows comics better is very useful in focusing my time when I'm working on comics and reading them because I, again, it's my third nerddom. So <laughs> when I started as a comics fan, very, very young, I think there were probably few enough titles being released that you just sort of read them, right? I mean, you you couldn't really be finicky. Um, yeah. And sometimes they were good and sometimes they weren't. Um, but now uh, it's such an embarrassment of riches. Um, and, and, you know, even the, the thing that most people don't get, and I'm sure you do, but a lot of people don't, is like even if you are sick to death of superheroes and you just don't want to see anything anyone in a cape ever again um you still have more choices with comics than you could possibly ever read um there's a lot of interesting stuff a lot of great sci-fi stuff going on right now so uh, any games that you would want to recommend that you think haven't gotten enough attention from people oh wow um uh, I don't know that I'm going to say anything that that people aren't already talking about. I'm, oh, you know, we like, can skip it then. It's fine. There's like Blades in the Dark. Uh, it's very cool. Um, you know, I'm still, after all these years, a huge Call of Cthulhu fan. Um, and and probably always will be. Um, you know, it's not a game. Um, it's a game product, but it's it's a Kickstarter that I happened to just see yesterday, um, and it's called Infinite Dungeon, and you should definitely go check it out. It's these pre-made dungeon maps, but they're on scrolls, and these scrolls are like 10 feet long, right? But you just kind of unroll them as you need them, and so you've got, you know, and it's got a grid on it, right? And they come with these uh, these... Um, like peel off stickers so that you can customize the locations and and of course it's it's dry erase so you can draw on them and um, really cool and <laughs> that's, I, was, that's I was very impressed. I'll check it out. I, I think I've seen that uh, advertised to me on social media and I certainly thought it was interesting too. But I, I I didn't click on the link, so I'll click on the link. Click on the link at least. Give it a look. See if that would be cool on your table. So in, in talking to you as, as many times as I have, um, a lot of names keep repeating both in your professional life and your personal life. Like Bruce Cordell mm-hmm. comes to mind as someone who uh, clearly you've shared uh, a friendship with, but also a, bi- a business relationship. Um, and again, I, I assume that he's not the only person because, I again, like Charles Ryan, I hear a lot. Shauna Germain, I hear a lot. Uh, and my, my question to you is, how have you navigated having friends that you're in business with and probably also gaming with at the same time? Like, that's a lot to, to put into one relationship. Uh, how, how has that worked out for you? Um, you know, for the most part, really well. Um, I guess I guess I'm the kind of person who... Uh, you know, not to delve into, you know, a therapy session or anything here. I'm the kind of person who doesn't get close to very many people, but the people that I do get close to, I get very close to. So, you know, you mentioned Bruce. Bruce and I have been friends since we were 14 years old and met in shop class because he was making this leather patch with a crossed uh, sword and axe. And I came up and said, hey, do you play Dungeons and Dragons? Um, And... Uh, we li- literally been friends ever since, and most of that time been working together as well. Um, and we both were at TSR and Wizards. Um, you know, Sean Reynolds is someone he also works with, like Bruce, works uh, for me at MCG. But, um, you know, I met Sean 20 years ago at TSR. And, um, you know, uh, I guess 
if you if you don't if you don't enter into that kind of relationship lightly, right? Like, like, uh, uh, you know, you, you get to really know someone. I know that, I know that the common thing is don't go into business with your friends, but, but, but I disagree. I think that if you know someone well enough to trust them to be a real true friend, right? If they're the kind of person who, that if you land in jail, they're the person you call to get bailed out, then, that's also a good person to be working with. And, you know, to be really exceptionally nerdy for a second, like how better to get to know somebody than to play in a role-playing game campaign for them with them for a couple of years, right? I mean, you really get to know. I, I sometimes feel like gamers have an advantage in that I think games create a bond that just going to the movies together or, you know, some other social activity isn't going to uh create because because you know you're not really all getting together to fight the dragon but but in a way you are right in the way you've you've suddenly got this cool shared memory this shared accomplishment that is different than you know oh we're just going to go to the baseball game together not that there's anything wrong with baseball i like baseball and i i I think that you've uh brought up something that is incredibly uh, honest and true, but that we never really talk about, which is that uh, gaming does create an unparalleled experience, which is why we devote as much time to it as we do. And right. why when it, when it goes bad, it's so disappointing. And, <laughs> you know, like if your character dies, I, I, I was talking to a friend last night who said, if my character dies, it's like I was literally kicked in the crotch. Like it's a literal painful experience he said and uh compounding that is the fact that i thought i was going to game tonight and it was going to be fun and now this is happening to me and, and again it'll, it can ruin people's days it can ruin their weeks um and i, I do feel like we struggle for vocabulary to a degree to just des- describe that experience a thing i'll say oftentimes is game makes the rest of life better Um, Like if you have a good session of game, you think about it all week, you look forward to having another good session the following week. Uh, But I feel like it's something that uh, when we're talking about it, we don't really say that very often. So it was good to hear you you say that about uh, bonding with people. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, because I'll just build on what you said a little bit, right? Because you, you do have those emotional highs and emotional lows in gaming, but... But in a traditional tabletop role-playing game, you're having them with other people, right? I can make a cool Skyrim character um, and advance in a bunch of levels, and then that character dies, or or that character super succeeds. And, you know, that's cool or not cool. And, uh, you know, but that, those are all experiences, you know, I can tell somebody about that, right? But it, I didn't share that with anybody. But, you know, you you know, fight off a horde of deep ones and call Cthulhu together, right? You've got that victory shared, right? You've got that shared experience and, and you'll always have that. And yeah. I mean, it sounds silly, right? Because of course it's all pretend and, and imaginary, but, um, but on so, some but so's sense, Hamlet. Right. so's Hamlet, you know? Right, right. And, and I, but I think that you're, uh, when you say that it's silly and it's not real, I think that's the reason that we hesitate to talk about it. Uh, because, you know, oh, you got upset that your elf died. You know, it's the kind of thing that you, <laughs> you'd hear as a joke on a, on a uh, show, right? But you do get upset that your elf dies because you're connected to that elf and it means something to you. And uh, I do think that that, I think that experience is visible in actual plays which is why I, I think it's one of the reasons that we're having the golden age we have now where people are starting to understand, oh, it's not just this thing that happens on paper. Uh, there's an actual, again, for lack of a better way of putting it, aesthetic experience that happens in gaming. And I want to be part of that aesthetic experience. Uh, yeah. One of my yeah, one of my players was super jazzed to start playing 5th edition because he's been into critical role. And he's never played D&D before. We played other role-playing games, but it's his first time playing D&D. And critical role has him primed for that experience. So uh, it, it's good to hear. That's um, cool. So uh, with that... Is what else would you uh, want to mention about the uh, Talus Kickstarter that uh, as reasons for people to back it? Uh, I'm going to go back it. I'm going to say right now, shamelessly. <laughs> um, 
Uh, okay, you're gonna force me into the sales pitch uh, scenario. Um, well, so you know, uh, we have a lot of cool stretch goals. We've met a lot of them. We've got more to come. Um, like I said, we're we're taking on the impossible task of making this amazing. Uh, beautiful deluxe book even better we're adding more art we're you know gonna uh, make some additional brand new adventures um, that will probably be separate from the 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 book but they'll be totally compatible um you know we're, we're making a, a gm screen we're you know all kinds of cool cool more to come um and you know i'm also gonna say the thing um it, here's it is true that we will produce enough Tolis to meet the Kickstarter demand, and then we will also sell it um, into distribution um, like we do with all, all MCG products. But I'll say that when this came out in 2006, it disappeared almost immediately, and... Uh, and it became very expensive on the uh, secondary market pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, in a way, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because, you know, so many people wanted it. And, you know, uh, this, here's the reality of publishing, right? When you produce something like this, you don't just reprint it when you need more. Um, it's too expensive to, you know, so when when we make these, we're going to make them and then there won't be any more. Um Kickstarter is probably the best way to ensure if you really want one that you're going to get one. Uh, okay, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I just need every gamer to have a podcast and I'll just go around and <laughs> personally sell each person. Well, I, I, I will send this into the universe as well. I, I moved this summer, bought, bought a house, moved out of an apartment, and yeah. I was like... I, I cannot move all of these role playing games. Oh like, my gosh. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the early 21st century, I was like, role playing games are dying. I will go buy all of them now, and then I'll never have to buy any ever again. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I was wrong about that, but uh, I had very thorough World of Darkness collections. I had very thorough uh, West End Games Star Wars collections. And I was like, I'm probably never going to play these games again. And if I did, I would probably just use a PDF. So I decided to sell them all this summer. And I made about $1,200 on just those collections. And again, I didn't do anything special. I just took them to a bookshop and, and sold them there. Uh, I'm sure I could have made more selling them online. But I do think about that now. I'm like, you know, oh, well, is this something that's going to appreciate in value? You know, if I hang on to it for 20 years, will I at least get my money back on it? And Because I got my money back on a lot of that stuff. So, hey, maybe Tolis is an investment. You know, it's, it's 150 bucks, but maybe I can resell it for 200 a couple years from now. I don't know. So uh, it, It's certainly possible. You know, and you never, it's just so weird. You never know. It's funny that you bring that up because just yes, literally yesterday, um, I was looking at something online and happened to notice people talking about these two supplements for this game called Cult with a K. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it came out like in the, I want to say it was in the 90s or oh, maybe yeah, early 2000s. Yeah. 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 Um, and well, I, I think the original was, was early 90s, but then like they kind of revitalized it a little bit late in the late 90s or something. Anyway, the point is. Like, there's these two thin little supplements that I happen to have on my shelf of cult. I don't even know why I still have them, um, you know, other than they're 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 kind of cool. Um, but I found out, what, like, one of them is worth $700 and one of them's worth $300. <laughs> and I had no idea, right? I... I, I I, mean, I, I probably, you know, I I could I could have just as easily imagined them getting tossed in a in a box for Goodwill. Um, again, not because they're terrible or anything, but you know, I, I'm I'm past that. I'm not playing Cult anymore right now. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's a funny side effect of the Golden Age of role playing that they they now have uh, appreciation value. But hey, that I'll take that. That's awesome. Collectors um, markets are something that I just have never really understood. Like I I like I get it on a basic level right certain things are rare and certain things are not and print runs and everything but but sometimes there are things that had a small print run and and are probably pretty rare but they don't appreciate and value. I, I don't understand what the there's like some kind of magic formula yeah <laughs> i don't know what it is 
Yeah, yeah. I, I at least with the West End Games stuff, I understood it. I was like, okay, you cannot get West End Games Star Wars ever again. Uh, you could get illegal pirated PDFs, but that's it. Um, so it made sense to me that that had value. But a lot of the World of Darkness stuff that moved su surprised me more. That I was getting, you know, like ten or fifteen dollars for World of Darkness splat books, and I was like, oh, well, that that's great. It makes my money back, and I just paid for <laughs> movers. So here we go. But, uh, <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the success of uh, your tallest Kickstarter. I can't wait to see the other things that MCG has coming down the pike. Uh, keep up the great work. And thank so again, much. thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Uh, 